Yep. Welcome back. So um, this the second morning lecture will be professor on the marginal object and the marginal subject. So this is a completely new lecture and I'm looking forward to this. So over to professor. Thank you very much Sandeep. Uh, I'm uh, uh, very happy that uh, we have this opportunity to uh, summarize all these marginal things. If you look at the uh, 20 titles of the lectures, then you will find marginal utility, marginal productivity, uh, comes up three times. Marginal productivity, labor, capital, and also the the last lecture will be a marginal productivity of social circulating capital, which is uh, going to be very interesting. Uh, now, the thing is that, of course, our uh, pioneer, Karl Menger, worked out the marginal utility idea. But it's not an isolated thing, as we have already seen. There are lots of other contact points between the protosphere and the logosphere. Should I stick with logosphere or go back to the noosphere? I think we should stick with your... Uh, stick. Yes. Because there's a slight uh, subtle difference. Yeah. All yeah. right. So I keep talking about the logosphere where the reason comes in human action comes in, which is completely missing from the protosphere, but there are lots of points of contact. And what the common idea is, which brings them together, is the method of marginalism. And we contrasted it with the method of averaging. It's a mathematical idea. But it's not applicable when reason and human action comes in. And in order to uh, continue our pioneering work in economics, we have to formalize this method of marginalism. And this is what is missing. That's one of my uh, points of criticism to uh, towards the uh, mainstream Austrian school, that they keep these ideas isolated rather than bringing the, the unifying idea it should be emphasized. And that's what uh, we are trying to do. So in this particular lecture, I would like to point out the similarities uh, and how we can fashion a new theory. We are at the very beginning of something here because I am suggesting a very ambitious project which will take much longer than I have left uh, time to live and uh, some of the younger people can uh, do very good work on this. I would like to see the method to almost to take over the whole field of economics because it is possible to unify. As it is, uh, it's, well, even just take this theory of interest is, is uh, falling apart, falling into pieces. There are people uh, fighting one another, even within our camp fighting with one another. What is the proper approach? So I'm looking for synthesis. I'm looking for unifying ideas rather than ideas which will compartmentalize uh, uh, economics. And as I say, the idea of mar the method of marginalism is uh, one of the things and in this lecture, we are going to review it. So going back to marginal utility, uh, we'll 
point out that there is going to be a marginal subject and there's going to be a ranking. And the ranking is according to <coughs> the utility <coughs> of something to a certain individual. <coughs> you see, uh, this, this is what is missing from the way they teach marginal utility. It's not even being taught at all the universities, <coughs> only a few, but it's being taught. And I think this is somehow uh, underemphasized or missing that the, uh, we are talking about marginal utility to someone. It's not a, an abstract idea that, or even an averaging idea that, uh, you know, the price itself could be an average, but marginal utility is the result of a ranking. So let's see how it goes. We uh, consider the spectrum of all the uh, commodities and uh, we have these two axioms. I was short of time when I lectured on this, the first lecture in the series during this session. Um, Menger introduced two postulates or axioms if you like. Uh, the two words we use synon synonymously, uh, axiom or postulate. The first postulate is the postulate of utility, and the second is postulate of marginal utility. Utility is increasing with quantity and marginal utility is decreasing with quantity. And we actually formulated it, this is perhaps uh, a little bit too formal, but uh, it doesn't do any harm sometimes to uh, use this uh, formal language. And that's how I stated it in uh, the, I'm referring to lecture one now, the uh, postulate of increasing utility. The economizing individual, when he is confronted with the choice between two different supplies of the same substance, same commodity, will choose the larger. I mean, <laughs> this is, uh, I think, fairly uncontroversial. I mean, somebody who is doing nitpicking might just say that uh, there are exceptions. But, uh, you know, we, let's just accept this, that if you f think that something is worth having, then it may be worth having just a little more just in case, you have a little reserve or a spare part or something like that. So this is, on, we can accept it as an axiom, as a postulate. Okay, but the important uh, postulate is number two, the postulate of declining marginal utility, and that was the big uh, breakthrough on the part of Menger when he announced this, that the th uh, uh, contrary to the quantity theorist who said that uh, utility was linear, it turns out that it's highly nonlinear because the increase in utility when you add just one more unit will be smaller. So that's how I put it in lecture one in, in the printed version. Um, the economizing individual acquiring subsequent units of a supply of the same good will earmark units acquired later 
with a lower priority than those units acquired earlier. So you build up a, an inventory of the same thing and uh, you do it piecemeal. You keep adding one, another one, another one. What is striking is that these new units added will have a declining utility. And it all tends to a point of satiation. You will uh, reach a point where you say, okay, it's enough. I don't want any more. Either because I ran out of storage space or for any other reason, I have reached my satiation point. And after that, the marginal utility is actually zero. Constant, but zero. And this is common experience again, but it had to be formulated, and, and Menger did it. And it was uh, very well received. Uh, all the economists of different uh, schools all welcomed this and said, that's the thing we need to have a theory of value. They did have a theory of value, but it was obviously a faulty theory that was the labor theory of value, suggesting that the value of any product is proportional with the amount of labor which goes into its production. And later they refined it by saying, the socially necessary labor, because you can produce things wastefully. Now you reduce it to, uh, by throwing out the thrills and keep the basic uh, socially necessary amount of labor going into the production. That's going to determine the value, and this is quite obviously wrong and uh, I don't want to go uh, through examples, but remember that the water could be very important uh, if you are in a desert. Uh, and uh, So let's just leave it. That is uh, the importance of the appearance of the concept of declining marginal utility. So that's the starting point. And now the question arises, is this uh, unambiguous? And then uh, some people say, well, it's not really, because uh, uh, utility means different things to different people. And uh, so the question is, marginal utility to whom? So the answer to that question is, the marginal utility of the marginal person. So what happens is that you rank the people who have interest in owning or having this particular substance, and you rank them according to the intensity of their desire. They won't all have the same degree of desire. Some of them will want to have it more badly than others, will be willing to make greater sacrifices in order to acquire it. So you rank them according to this intensity of desire and then you have this ranking, the people uh, ranked according to their utility. Uh, or put it uh, that way, their desire, oh, no, that's, that's fine. The utility of this substance for each different individual. And then you take the top, well, there are some who already have it, and there are some who haven't. And the cutting off point <coughs> is the marginal subject. It's the person who is ready to acquire it, 
right now. The others have less intensity of a desire. So the, the margin, the, the two things, the ranking on the one hand and the marginal subject on the other. And that is the combination which you need in order to uh, define marginal utility. Now, right there we put next to it the marginal productivity of labor, which is really the same procedure. You rank the individuals with the productivity of their labor. And that will give you the ranking and at the top of the list, these are submarginal because we are talking about the people who are not yet put into production, who are waiting, they are workers in waiting, let's say, and the cutoff point is the marginal subject again. So the ranking gives rise to marginal uh, subject and it is the productivity of the marginal worker. But use the word subject because we keep this at the general level. We have a pattern now which will be applied in quite different fields. And that is the definition of marginal productivity of labor. And then we go to the marginal productivity of capital. Now, there are lots of nitty-gritty there which we can uh, ignore, but the important thing is that again there is a ranking. But here it's not ranking people, it's ranking things. Uh, capital goods from the point of view of productivity. But ranking it is. And then you have this cutoff point, the marginal object. So it could be a marginal object, marginal subject, but the uh, definition is going to be the same you define the marginal productivity of capital as the productivity per unit of value of that uh, contribution belonging to the marginal object. And uh, I'm going to ignore marginal productivity of that here, but I will mention the marginal time preference, because this is another beautiful example of the method of marginalism and uh, one where Mises uh, did not think it was necessary to work out these details, which by the way he himself did for the productive, the margin productive of labor, but he didn't think it was necessary to work it out in the same way for the time preference. Here, and, and I will immediately uh, tell you after I finish this, why I think he, he missed that. Well, he did it on purpose, but let's just uh, finish the idea first. So you want to define uh, product, uh, sorry, your time preference. And you realize that people have different time preferences. The two extremes I keep mentioning is Scrooge from Dickens, Charles Dickens, Chris, Christmas? Christ, Christmas Carol. Christmas Carol. And, and the prodigal son from the New Testament. It's a parable uh, of uh, the uh, the son inherited a large fortune from his father and he immediately blew it. You see, his uh, time preference was very, very low. 
But these are two extremes, and obviously you and I fall somewhere in between. And uh, the question is how to hit that. It's not going to be averaging, it cannot be. Because the human action is involved, because reason is involved, and we are in the logosphere. We are not in the protosphere.